born one morning when it was drizzling rain. I was born one morning when it was drizzling rain. I picked up my shovel and I walked to the mines. I picked up my shovel and I walked to the mines. I loaded 16 ton of number nine coal. I loaded 16 ton of number nine coal. For those of us who grew up with it, coal is intrinsic. Is coal important to your family? I don't know. Is it to your family? Yes. That creates the kind of bond that you don't just make with any co-worker. No. But coal mining, you go underground and sacrifice your life. You right. know, sweat and bleed and work. I've seen a time of brotherhood. For nearly a century, we've been told this place is nothing without a king. But like All of this stuff used to be trees and green leaves and ferns. Its spirit fades away. They say my father's father. In the beginning, this place was wild. Sometimes I wonder if our king's ghost is trapped here. I guess you can't take my memories from me. It is not dirty or clean. It is elemental. I learned that you can be proud of your life and want better for them that come after you. There have always been those of us looking for stories that keep us alive. That was the trailer for the new feature documentary, King Cole, and this is Factual America. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Each week I watch a hit documentary and then talk with the filmmakers and their subjects. A lyrical tapestry of a place and people, King Cole mediates on the complex history and future of the coal industry, the communities it has shaped, and the myths it has created. Emmy-winning and Oscar-nominated filmmaker Elaine McMillian Sheldon reshapes the boundaries of documentary filmmaking in a beautiful and deeply moving immersion into central Appalachia, where coal is not just a resource, but a way of life. In the process, Elaine imagines the ways that a community can re-envision itself. Join us as we talk with Elaine about having to break all of her own filmmaking rules to make King Coal, which she notes is part documentary and part fable. Stay tuned. Elaine, welcome to Factual America. How are things with you? I'm great. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing well. Uh, congratulations again. Uh, you know, how does it feel to finally get King Cole to the big screen? It's exciting. We um, premiered in January at Sundance, have gone to festivals, and have gotten a lot of really interesting feedback from audiences all over the country. And it's exciting to see people get the universality of the story, even though it's about a specific place. Well, I should just remind our listeners and viewers that uh, we are talking about King Cole. It, as you said, premiered at Sundance. It, uh, you're nominated for a Next Innovator Award. You've been screening across the country. I believe you've got some theatrical releases coming in August. So thanks again, and thanks again for making this beautiful, personal, yet universal film. So uh, the advice I had was to see it on as big a screen as I could with the best sound possible, and I'm thank goodness for that, because uh, usually I'm exiled to the office on my little laptop, but I did manage to commandeer the family TV, so I, I do appreciate that. Um, so for many of our listeners and uh, viewers, they probably haven't had a chance to see King Cole yet, so for them, uh, what is King Cole all about? Maybe you can give us a synopsis. Sure. I've been describing it as a part documentary, part fable, um, in the sense that we are exploring coal culture. So the the culture and ritual um, that form identity and belonging in central Appalachia around the coal industry. So you see things like coal pageants and coal education in the classroom and coal 5Ks. And that's certainly a part of the film is, is showing this, this sort of kingdom, the kingdom of King Coal and the things that people do. But the film's also about the future and it's about dreams and imagination and the role, role of resilience and mourning 
um, in finding out what's next. And so there's two young girls at the center and we follow them as they go through sort of life in the coal fields and start pondering the future. And um, it's narrated by me. I talk about my own personal memories as a coal miner's daughter, but also um, questions I have for the future. And uh, I mean, I think you'd be the first to acknowledge that uh, Appalachia and West Virginia specifically have been the subject of many docs. Um, yeah. <laughs> but what is <laughs> going way back? Uh, but what do you think you're capturing that others may have not? Well, I grew up here and I still live here. So I have some skin in the game um, in terms of is this place going to have a what's this place's role in the future? Um, and I think generally when people think of this region, they think of the story being over. And to me, the story is just beginning. And so with any ending, there's a new beginning. And that's really the call to action of this film is we've lived through um, an incredible 200 years where we've been dominated, our lives have been dominated by a single industry. And now we're being told to move on and get over it. And without being recognized for the sacrifice that's been given. And so the question is, uh, it's an urgent question. It's a relevant question of today is what communities are left behind and in this transition that we all know is happening and needs to happen. Um, and so I hope that the dignity of the people and I hope that the beauty of the place comes through because those two things are important things for me as an Appalachian. Okay. And before I, 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 I hear what you're saying about looking ahead and in the future, but maybe as this native West Virginia, as this, daughter of a coal miner and a from a coal mining family what what is this what i mean i guess it's natural but what is this grip that king coal has on west virginia and in appalachia because i think your film just shows that so well in a um in a place where it's i think in some of the uh, pr materials it's described as a way of life but yet at the same time only employs twelve thousand people nowadays it's less than one percent of the population roughly it's but it's ingrained in time and place yeah. And mindset. So what is this grip that King Cole has? Yeah, it's interesting because if this was just a story about facts and figures, it would make no sense. But this film's really about the psyche and soul. And um, you know, I I think that uh King Cole dominates a time when work and pride in work of uh, belonging was was a huge part of our identity. And, you know, I don't know that most people living in the country know that the coal that's being mined mostly in Appalachia today is is for steel, for making steel, not power. And so there's a sense of importance for the people that do this work that they feel that they're contributing to. Um, certainly the numbers are low, right? I think, I think Walmart's our biggest private employer in West Virginia, which is um, pretty wild. But there's there's nothing to to not say that the value of something that brings people together. And the reason coal mining brought people together is it's a very dangerous job and your entire community is involved in that process. Um, whether you're pro or anti, whether it's polluting your water or you're mining the coal and, and you're the same person, by the way. Um, and so I think that, you know, it's a lot more complicated, unfortunately, than just the number, the employment number. Um, it is a sense of belonging and identity. And that's partly because Appalachia is pretty remote and there have been political moves um, and power at play to keep coal to be the only option, right? And um, I think that right now we're in a, a transition stage and it's really exciting to see people being able to break through um, what has been dominant in the past to actually find something that's serving people more fully. I mean, one thing that there's many incredible scenes that you have, but there's one that struck me because I've I, we're based in the UK, but I was in the US recently visiting family, and we went to a baseball game, and they had asked everyone who's like a veteran to stand up and you know say hello, and their family sent with him. You've got that scene in the high school football game where they ask every real miner to stand up, and it's it's this I think something you've also captured about how close miners and also their families have always been to death. It's almost like a fighting a, a war. Is, yeah. Is and that's not something that was created by the communities. That was actual war propaganda in World War II. When in World War II, you were not drafted if you were a minor. 
you were exempt from the draft. Um, and there were propaganda posters that had a soldier holding a gun and a miner holding a, a shovel and a pickaxe on the posters for the World War II fuel administration. And so this was something that was, you know, built up through the, even the, the federal government. Um, yeah, it's a very fascinating history and, and miners are seen as, as heroes in that way. Not to all, I will say, but to some. Yeah, And also I would now, say King Cole, actually, the phrase King Cole comes from the UK. So we, we owe- Was the, that right? Yeah, we owe, the, we owe that um, ballad and uh, fableism to King Cole, which actually, you know, UK paved the way for us understanding the role of coal. See, I thought it was the Upton Sinclair novel, but no, there, this, there pre you go. this predates <laughs> that even. Yeah. <laughs> so, speaking of, I mean, what made you want to tell this story now, and uh, you know, and how did how did this project get started? It got started because of these cultures are dying, and I felt a sense of important uh, urgency to document them as a living archive before they were gone. I grew up in coal country. I think it's probably one of the most misunderstood places. In the region, it's largely depicted by people who drop in for one day with a, a pre-written script about us. And so I knew that I wanted to show these places and show these cultures um, before they were gone because they are they are disappearing and nobody's in denial of that. The communities know what's what's what they're facing. Um, and I think right now it's important because we're at, we're all at this transition period and the conversation that's being had is 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 often not um it's not one about people it's um it's one that is um a little too black and white for my taste um that doesn't take in the fact that humans from the beginning we have resisted change right and this is a universal thing and this is not just something that you know i think Appalachians are seen as being stuck in the past when this is a very human thing to resist change. Um, and also, uh, it's a beautiful place. And I think that we're seeing, we're seeing more and more um, potential in the beauty. And so to have a history that is pretty destructive, to have a history that's been extractive about taking and taking and taking for the betterment of other people and other places, we wanted to reframe that as we're in the transition period to make make me actually see this place as something different than just a place to take something from. And talking about being people focused and looking to the future, how did you find the two anchors of this of the project? You have the two girls that are at the center of this story. Uh, what are they about seventh grade or something? Yeah, that, six, yeah. Six, seventh grade. Sixth they, grade. Yeah. Well, I broke all my rules for documentary filmmaking when making this <laughs> film. It's a, you know, it's a hybrid film. I really, I didn't go into it wanting to break those rules. I really just wanted to tell this story and, and figuring out the ways we needed to tell this story. And dance was part of that. And so we cast the girls at dance, local dance studios. And we were looking for girls that had ties to coal in some way. And Lainey knew her coal history. She's the redhead. She has generations of minors. And Gabby learned her coal history through the making of the film. So the scene when she goes to the coal camp with her grandma is the first time she's learning that her own great grandpa was a minor. Um, and so that was important too, because I think people uh, perceive Appalachia as being largely white and the stories of black minors and black families aren't often seen. So Gabby and her family play a really important role in a new story as well. And then, as you said, you're breaking your, all your own rules. Uh, did you start out trying to, ma for lack of a better way of putting it, did you start out trying to make an artistic film? I mean, did you no. plan to push boundaries of documentary filmmaking no. when you started telling this story? Or was no. that just the best way to tell the story? No, I'm pretty, I'm actually like pretty adverse to uh, adventure. <laughs> I'm a pretty safe <laughs> person. But this film required me to break my rules because I, I was trying to tell a story that couldn't like, it can't be told through facts and figures. Like you said, it's 12,000 miners. What are we even talking about here? We're talking about something that is internal. It's not something that's seen. It's not something we can line up in front and make sense of. It's something that's deeply felt, something that is grief. It's, it's a film about grief. It's a film about mourning. And how do we get there? You know, I decided we'd get there through sound art. I decided we'd get there through dance. I decided we'd get there through narration. But these these were not tools that I was like, okay, here's my checklist of the things I want to experiment as a filmmaker. It was like, how do I get 
to the psychology of the story. It's a very difficult story to transmit um, just through talking heads and, and B-roll. Yeah. And it's a, a deeply personal story for you. I mean, you've got this this incredible voiceover, and that's all you who wrote that? That's all your own words, is that... I wrote, I wrote, and I wrote, and I wrote from every perspective to avoid it being from Elaine's perspective. I was not supposed to be the narrator. I was not, this was not what was supposed to happen. Um, I wrote from the perspective of someone from the past, someone from the future, um, and with the help of my team and contributing writers who were editing me for tone and style and was I making sense and was I being clear and points was I was I pushing in directions that were challenging and was I pulling back in times to be sensitive so it's, we the, the film walks a really fine line it's not taking a political view it's not prescribing a solution um, and so it does that through the personal narrative and I didn't do it alone but yes those are my words and those are my memories um, and they're also a collection of just what it's been like to live here for the past 35 years of my life. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Um, you said you had help. I did notice is, is Shane Boris has a writer credit and uh, Logan Hill as well. I mean, how did, yeah. how did that, how did they come on board? Well, Shane's my producer um, along with Diane Becker and Peggy Drexler and Shane, I brought on early because he has worked in this hybrid film space before you know he's worked on films like all these sleepless nights and shane was really instrumental in giving me permission to break my own rules and that helped me a lot um but yeah shane would read countless drafts of my ponderings and uh let me know when i was off base and when i was on base and shane brought on logan um, logan had worked on the edge of democracy with shane and some other films and and what logan brought was an incredible amount of clarity he read the first thing he did read 15 pages of free notes that i had written and came back to me and said i think this is what you're trying to say and i was like that's exactly what i'm trying to say how do we how do we say that yeah and then Heather Hanna, I have to give her credit, she gives the final speech at the end of the film. We didn't know what she was going to say. So that final scene, yes, it's set up, but she delivered the speech that she wrote the end of the film. I had not even met her before that day. I had no clue what she was going to say. And so we brought her on as a contributing writer because she was so in line with the thinking of the film. Okay, not No spoiler alert, but uh, there's a... There's a funeral at the end of the piece. It's not necessarily how anyone expected this to go, but as you say, we're breaking all your own rules. <laughs> we are. What but what better way to put a foot forward than to say goodbye? Yeah. Right? <laughs> I mean, how do you how do you welcome a new beginning without saying goodbye to the to the ending? I think that's a very good point. And then when did you realize you had something special in your hands? I mean, you probably feel that every filmmaker feels that about all their projects, but this is there's something unique about this one, isn't there? I, I mean, I hope people feel it's special. I, um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know that I, I, I feel, I personally just feel really gratified by the process because it was, it was healing for me too. And my own family, my family and I've been able to have conversations that have come from this film that I never thought we'd have before. Um, I was very worried about alienating, the coal community that's not been the case and i just feel really hopeful that this film can can be civil in that sense of having a dialogue that i wasn't having previously so i just feel very nourished by the whole process and um honestly once we showed it to a couple of miners in the beginning stages and they were weeping afterwards i decided that i didn't really care what anyone else thought about it. I thought it would be wonderful if people experienced it in a theater as a cinematic experience. Absolutely. But the fact that it could reach someone who had sacrificed so much um, and had been demonized so much and he felt seen. Um, I just felt like my job was done at that point. Well, I think unfortunately our job is done. We only had a limited amount of time together, but just thank you so much for, uh, coming onto the podcast. It's really much, much appreciated. Just to remind our listeners and viewers, we've been talking with Elaine McMillian Sheldon, the director and producer of King Cole, premiered at Sundance. It's been screening at festivals across the country in the U.S., limited theatrical release from August. And do check out her uh, eponymous website, ElaineMcMillianSheldon.com, which I really enjoyed, including the link to the John Prine video, which maybe we can talk about another time. Yeah, so, uh, for sure. 
thanks again for coming on. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much for having me. We hope you enjoyed that episode of Factual America. If you did, please remember to like us and share us with your friends and family, wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. I would also like to thank those who make this podcast possible. A big shout out to Sam and Joe at Intersound Audio in York, England. A big thanks to Amy Ord, our podcast manager at Alamo Pictures, who makes sure we continue getting great guests onto the show and everything runs smoothly. And finally, a big thanks to you, our listeners. Many of you have been with us for four incredible seasons. Please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas, whether it is on YouTube, social media, or directly by email. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Alamo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.